I, I thought I would, I would talk about my own awakening process because I believe that we all have our own awakening process and I think it's really important for us all to know that it's very, it's very unique. We're, we're, we're completely unique individuals. And sometimes we read about a guru out in India or a guru out across the world or a guru right here in the United States and, and we try to mirror that awakening process that they had and think, okay, well, they did this, they ran off here and that, so I'm going to do that same thing. When often that's not exactly what the awakening process for you is, that natural process inside of us, because I believe it's natural. I believe it's nature. Our awakening process is nature. We are nature. We are nature. We are as much nature as the trees, the flowers, the birds, the bees. We are nature. We are the earth energy. Every molecule in our body was once in this planet. A vegetable we ate or fruit or the air we breathe, the molecules we breathe. I remember being in high school and one of the most profound moments in high school, I had two profound moments, I could actually share them both with you, but one of the most profound was I was in a science class and it, they were talking about the exchange of molecules. And the instructor said, a molecule in your body could be in a tree on the other side of the planet in a day or two. I was like, wow, we are all one. We are all connected. I started studying the Course in Miracles in high school back in the 70s. Actually, before that, my, my spiritual journey started when I was born, pretty much, when, since I can remember, because I used to talk to my grandmother, who was an atheist, and I would, was five years old, and I remember telling her, you are spirit, you're infinite, you don't die, you're not your body. And I, I hate to use this analogy, but this is what I said because it scares me. You'd want to be really careful what you say, because what you say you create and you put words out into the universe. But as a little girl at five years old, and I hadn't read any books yet, I used to say, Nanny, if you took my arm off, I'd still be all me. If you took, and I'd go through all the body parts till there was nothing left. I let, I, the head was the last thing. <laughs> so I really don't want to create that. But I said, I'm on, my body's all gone. I'm still here. I'm still whole. I am not my body. I don't know where I got that at five, but there was something inside of me that knew I was an eternal spirit at five years old. I always had that. But then I went through my process as a human being, and I, I was talking to Diane Christian since she's my best friend. I love her to death, to pieces. <laughs> Careful what we say, right? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> and she was saying, we are divine spirit having a human experience. So why aren't we really embracing this humanity more? This human presence. This is, we've come to be humans. We've come to experience what it's like to be divine infinite magnificence. And what is it like to be that, but to experience ourselves through a body? And so I'm a yoga instructor. I really embrace the body. And, and one of the things is embodiment has been really powerful for me, bringing that light, that presence into my body. Because the first part of my life during trauma, so I, I grew up very in the early years, awakened, and I'd be in the woods. I, you find me, I'm in the woods. Anyone doesn't know where Bonnie is, go out in the woods and find her. I was a nature child. I'm still a nature child. Any free moment, I'm in nature. We are nature. And, but I, I went through a lot of traumas. I had a very traumatic childhood. I, I had a mother who had an illness, and she would be gone sometime. There was, there was some abuse happening. There was a lot of trauma. And I, we've all, I think as human beings, especially as children, go through trauma. Uh, we can't, no matter what, even perfect times and perfect families, we go through some traumas and we go through some wounds as children. And that, that, that's very real as human beings, spiritual beings having a human experience. And that's just something that we, we kind of share universally. And then as we become older adults, for me it was, it was very spiritual. I started studying the Course in Miracles. Well, actually before that, I started riding my bike down to the bookstore in my town across town. I didn't even know it was there, but I was riding my bike, and synchronistically, I saw this little bookstore. I thought I would go and check it out. 
I like to read. I went to the very back of the bookstore. I don't even know. I didn't even look at that. There was sure there was lots of subjects, but for some reason, I just went straight to the back, and there was a metaphysical wall. I was like eight or nine years old, and I ten cents a book. I would eat them up. Master of the Universe, The Way, all these crazy books, and I loved them. I would eat them up. I would just read them and read them and read them. And you know, eight, nine, ten years old, I, I loved these books. And I would have these profound experiences in the wood. I would become one with the universe. I would, I would, I would literally feel like I'm God, and everything's God. The trees are God, and I, I'd have so much love. It would be so much joy in my heart. It would be like exploding. And I miss. I would say to myself, I can't contain this joy. I can't contain it. I can't contain it. And then I remember one Sunday, we were. A very religious family. We made sure to be very consistent and go to church on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> every Christmas and every Easter. It was Easter, and I had been out in the woods, and I had this profound experience. I was it, everything was heightened. I couldn't contain the joy, and then I was brought to the church, and I sat there. It was I was about eight or nine years old, and I remember just looking around and going, "Wow." It's kind of dead in here. <laughs> like, I mean, I was eight years old, and I was just like, "It's." I want to go back to the woods. I want to go back and play with the frogs and the ponds, and I want to go back. I felt God in the trees everywhere. I was exploding with joy, and I and I just didn't feel it. And I, I looked around. It didn't seem like anyone else was feeling it either. <laughs> I'm only eight years old. And I remember just thinking to myself, you know, and, then, and I, there was someone up there, and the, you know, talking a, a priest, and he was talking about love and joy. And I remember hearing the words, but saying like, "Yeah, you're saying the words, but we're not really feeling a lot of it in here. We're not, we're not feeling it." And so I was, I wanted to, I, with every ounce of my being, I wanted to step up on the on the pew, and I want on my seat, and I wanted to. Scream. Scream as high as I could and say, "Everybody, everybody, let's not talk about love and joy. Let's not talk about it. Let's go out the wood. Follow me. I'll show you the woods. We will go out and we'll experience it. We'll be it. We'll be that love and joy." And I, I, I knew that my mom and dad probably wouldn't like that. The priest probably wouldn't like that. The, I wouldn't. I might be in trouble. So I contained myself, but I got to say it right now. I got to say it. Well, finally, this is the first time I've said it <laughs> since I was nine years old. <laughs> so I've had this passion inside me to not talk about, but to experience. To experience. I, I don't want to. Who wants to sit around a cake, per se, and talk about how delicious it is? Talk about eating it. No, we want to eat it, right? We want to eat that cake. We want to eat our cake, have it, need it too, right? We want to have it, need it too. We want to experience it. Who wants to talk about riding a bike? We want to get up and ride it, experience. And, and it's things that can't be explained, can't be put into words. You can't describe what it feels like to ride a bike, and and, and then someone can't get that experience through your words. They have to go up and get on the bike and feel it for themselves, and then they have their own unique experience of what it is to ride a bike, and it's all unique. It's all unique. So then I came to Salt Lake City. I didn't even know it existed a week before I got here. It was very synchronistic, <laughs> truly. I got here. A friend was. I was actually in Vegas, Las Vegas visiting my brother. I had met a friend. It was 1994. I'd gone to a Course in Miracles retreat that summer. I'd met a friend there who called me. It was a two-week trip. Called me in the middle of the trip and said, "Do you want to check out Salt Lake City?" And I says, "Where is Salt Lake City?" He says, "In Utah. Where's Utah?" I, I, I'd never even, you know, I'm sure in fourth grade we did the states, but at that time, I hadn't heard of Utah. I didn't know where it was. He said, "It's north of Vegas." I says, "Well, what's it like there?" And This is the truth. This is what he said. There's mountains and there's Mormons. <laughs> well, the, um, I love the mountains. I love nature. I love the outdoors. So I said, I love mountains. I love them. But what are Mormons? I had never heard of a Mormon. 
I came from back east. I had never heard of a Mormon. He said there are people that have a lot of children that wear hand-me-down clothes. <laughs> Truly, that's what he said. I, mean, <laughs> I said I love children, and I wore hand-me-down clothes my whole life. I had a cousin who was a year older than me. Bring me, pick me up, and take me. I was in the middle of separating from my children's father. It was a little ugly. So I said, "Pick me up." So I got here with a sack over my back. I was a hobo. Yep, I had a little stick, sack, one suitcase, with my children's clothes, my clothes, and that's it. That was my possessions. Maybe a few hundred dollars. No house, no car, no job, no friends, except for the two people that had bring and brought me here. Really, nothing. I had. I knew nobody. I had nothing. I didn't have a, a home, so I, I slept in a basement of some friends that they knew. I think there was about 12 of us in one full bathroom, one half bathroom. So on my way to work, I would stop by Rite Aid and use their facilities to brush my teeth, use the bathroom. But I was here, and I, I, as in retrospect, it was the most divine orchestration. I wasn't in charge. I was just following the moment-to-moment -moment experience. Spontaneous. It was completely spontaneous. When I had gone to my brothers in Vegas, I didn't know I'd be coming to Salt Lake City. I didn't even know it existed. But here I am, Salt Lake City, Utah, and I continued my spiritual path, my my awakening process. And I believe the awakening process is in happening inside of all of us. We are all awakening. I, I, I kind of cringe a little bit when I hear people say. Oh, he's awakened, or she's awakened, or are you awakened, or there are they awakened? I mean, it's just I bought into that maybe years ago when you're young and you're like, oh, when I was getting those books, I got to be enlightened, I got to be awakened. But I think as we mature spiritually, we realize that we are all awakening, and we are all awakening together. It's not an independent thing. We're nature. We're nature. When flowers bloom in the spring. The whole field blooms, not just one flower. It doesn't bloom alone. Rarely, the whole field blooms. So we are, as, as, as a human global community, we are blooming together. And I believe it's an ongoing flowering. It's an ongoing blooming for all of us. We're walking each other home, side by side, hand in hand, as equals. Flowers are equals, right? They're all equal, and so the the I, I don't I like to try to eliminate that hierarchy in this awakening process. We're all awakening together, and that's been part of my evolution. And and when I first came to Salt Lake City as a single mom, working really trying to hard to make ends meet, but also really pursuing my spiritual path, I became a massage therapist. I started holding meditations and Reiki classes and. Any class I could devise, I would get down in the basement on my word processes with about ten bottles of whiteout, as I needed them. Trust me, they were not like computers. If anyone remembers those old word processes, and I'd cr I, I needed extra money. I was I was raising my kids alone with no help from anyone. All my family was back east, and I, I was the sole provider. And so I would create a class, and then I would advertise it, and people would come. I'd advertise my meditations and. That's how my nonprofit started. Was through my meditations. I would have a small meditation every month, and a dear friend of mine, Sandra Melbourne, many of you might know, she said to me, she says, "Why don't you put a donation basket? You provide snacks for everybody, and have it potluck as well." And I says, "No, this is my service. This is my service. I, this is my giving. It's my seva." And so she convinced me, and I says, "I'll take that money and I'll put it into a charity." And then I eventually created a. You know, a non-profit 501c3 organization, and we've been doing that ever since, and it's 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 been profound. And so I continued, but I went through this period of a, lo a lot of meditation, but a lot of searching, a lot of striving, a lot of just I've got to you know I got to get better, I got to get fixed, I got to be healed, I I got to, and and I I don't regret any of that. I remember one time being in a profound meditation. Deep, profound meditation, and I was in ecstasy and rapture, and and that you know, music meditation, music is huge for me. If I sit and listen to music, it doesn't take more than a few instants before I, my heart's just in rapture. I'm just like, oh my god, 
so nice. I, that's just my catalyst. And I, I'd been sitting there for a couple hours, just blissed out into the heavens. And my kids got home. They were pretty young at the time. I have no idea what they did, but I freaked out. I snapped at them or something, and I was just. And I said to myself, two minutes ago, you were in rapture. You were expanded out into the infinite bounds of the universe, and now you're just." just, just uh, I don't even want to see the word that just came to my mind, but it started with B and it ended with itch. So, <laughs> this weren't your chairs, though. I don't want to swear, but I, I was not pretty, and it was a wake-up call for me. So I, I did. I started to do. I started to go through really going through de deconditioning. Some really, I work with Byron Katie. I did some Landmark Forum. I, I, I mean, I read books. I went through processes. I mean, you name it. I mean, I can tell you it was a lot. When I get driven about something, watch out. <laughs> Diane's laughing. I think I took every, you know, course. I, I, I was just really. I, I've got to decondition myself. I've got there's wounds and went through a lot of relationships that didn't work out. Went through a lot of things that, you know, a lot of attachment and trying to manipulate. Anybody here do any of that? Where am I the only one? <laughs> one person holds her hand. Well, it's you and me. We're together. Two of us have tried to manipulate and been attached. I remember being attached to outcomes and and、uh, you know just seeing this stuff of trying to be human and work through things and really observing the humanness of who I am. And and things that didn't work because I remember when I would get attached. Or where I tried to manipulate an outcome, it just was never a very pretty picture. It really wasn't, and I think I, I think I had to see that more than once, more than twice, to see that you know that just isn't the highest road. To 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 fail, to fail in in those ways, of really human ways of wanting to look good or wanting to, you know, figure everything out, and they're all so innocent. Because I believe there's only love and a call for love, love or innocent confusion. I believe that. Since I have a video, I just watched. It, I'm holding my son, who's 25 now, and he wasn't even a year. And、uh, I was asked, "What do you want to tell the world?" I said, "There's only love and a call for love." And not that I've always practiced that. I, I have always intended to practice it, but there's been times where I have something has happened, and I went, "Oh." We forget. We have to remind ourselves these things. We need to remind them over and over, and a lot of a lot of reminding, a lot of repetition. And and I got to a point where I was I I had a very traumatic experience, and I realized a message came. I was spiraling down and spiraling and spiraling down. It, it was had to do with a man, and he was giving another woman attention, not me. And that wasn't working too good for me at the moment. I was not happy that that he was over there flirting with some woman and laughing, and I was sitting all alone, and I was spiraling down. And I, I, this voice came through my mind. It just came through, like burned through, like a bolt of lightning. And it was like, as long as you believe that your source of love, happiness, or security is anywhere, anywhere. Outside yourself, anywhere other than within you, you will always, always suffer. And it was a wake-up call, another wake-up call, big wake-up call. And I literally turned directions. I was alone at the time. There was no one to call. There was no one to email. There was no. I was out in the boonies. And I just something happened inside of me where my eyeball turned around, and boom, I started bringing the energy in, bringing the love in. I just I need to be responsible to being my source of love, of security. And now I'm not going to say that I have even perfected it now. It was a couple years ago. However, it has been a different direction, a different path. Now I've heard all my life. About go within. Kingdom of heaven is within. I heard it and I read it and I heard it, but it wasn't really until that moment. I'd spent a lot of time in meditation, but it wasn't until that moment where I really stopped and turned direction and went in, 
And I kept going in, and I sent myself love, and I kept going in, and I kept going in and sending myself love. I, and at first, I didn't know how to do it. How, I didn't know how to love myself. So I, I would think about my kids and my, my grandbabies, and I'd think about them, and then I would bring that love that I churned up and I'd direct it in towards myself. I'd look in my eyes, and I'd eye gaze, and I'd send my eyes love. And I continued to do that, and that opened a whole new life for me. Then everything seemed to shift. Everything seemed to change. I had a spontaneous baptism at the hot springs, where I, I came up from the baptism. I didn't know I'd baptize myself. I had no idea that was an instantaneous thing. When I sat in the hot springs, I said, baptize yourself. I said, okay. I went under the water for a little while. Came up. When I came up, I heard, now you live a spontaneous life. I said, okay, great. I take that on. I have no idea what it is but I'm going to take it on. Sounds good. It enlivened me. And I still don't know what it is. I still don't. I had a spontaneous confession with Diane and Phil one night. We went to dinner, and I started crying, and I said, I just got to tell you everything. I got to tell you everything, everything, all, every... None of us knew that was going to happen. Spontaneous retreat. Now I'm speaking spontaneously. But the key to everything was my attention. That is the gift. That is the message I want to leave everyone with, is I realize we all have the gift of attention. Attention. No one doesn't have, everyone has this key. And the attention came inward. And that is something that can't be described. It's something that never ends. As you just keep going in, and in, it doesn't end. There's a bottomless, infinite experience of that. But to me, it's like the light bulb getting plugged into the socket. It's like the tree being reconnected to its roots. And I just keep going in. And so I've committed every day before I even get up out of bed, I will spend time, and I don't even tell myself how much time, and I will just bring my energy in, 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 deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in. And that's, what I, that's my message. That's my awakening process. It continues. It continues for all of us. But once we turn and we go in and we bring that energy in, and it's not a success or failure. It's, it's, there's, it's just some days I go in a little more and deeper than others, but I just continue to nourish and connect to my roots, the depths of my being, because we are all magnificent beings. We are all divine, magnificent grace. And within us is, is infinite, magnificent grace. Each and every one of us, we all have a profound purpose. So I thank you all so much for listening. And I acknowledge you and bless you as the awakening, profound beings that you are.